What inspired you to dive in first? I, th I think there were two main drivers. Um, one was the uh, I, I was I was finding myself uh, becoming more um, having more of a public profile and being more of a uh, source for journalists uh, who wanted background on climate modeling or paleo climate. And I was finding myself when something came up, uh, like a new paper or something, um, somebody would call me up and I would explain the background on the last glacial maximum or the background on climate models or climate sensitivity. Uh, and that would take me, you know, half an hour to an hour and it was great and everybody appreciated it. And then the second I put down the phone, somebody else would call me up and ask me exactly the same thing. Uh, so the, f the first thing that came to mind was, you know, by blogging about these things, by blogging about the context, uh, one could save a bit of time because you wouldn't have to keep repeating yourself. Okay, so so that yeah. was that was one thing, and then uh, the second element was just a recognition that there really wasn't a lot of nuance or context to most of what happened when people were discussing climate science in the media. Uh, there was, uh, you know, we'd, we'd have the same kind of news stories that we have now, you know, a new report, a new paper, a new observation. Um, but almost all of these stories, and, and this is still true, of course, uh, start off with the assumption that you know nothing. And by the time that they get to the end of the story, uh, you, you pretty much still know not very much, except that there's been a new paper about something that was related to something you don't really know about. And that's not a that's not an indictment of all of all journalism uh, on this topic, but but the amount of information that you can cram into you know a two column piece is is small, uh, and I think that leaves room for people who want to misuse the science, who want to misrepresent the science, who want to leap to uh, conclusions that are not justified by the science, uh, far too much scope, and so. I had been, like, kind of from the early 2000s, uh, you know, and, uh, trying to, you know, inject actual knowledge into discussions about climate science. And then I'd started off um, by doing that, by writing letters to the editor when there was something egregious uh, printed. Um, and, and at the beginning, I, I thought, oh, well, they've got this completely wrong. Um, wait, wait, I'll, just, I'll, just to uh, pause for a second. These students uh, had an exercise just recently where they had to write letters to the editor to, oh, yes, just yes. To, to flex those muscles. But anyway. Okay. Well, I mean, so that was it. So I was flexing my muscles with letters to the editor under the naive impression uh, that if I just told people what the right answer was, they wouldn't get it wrong in the future. Um, so I, I was very quickly disabused of, of that notion. Uh, but I still felt it was important that content knowledge have a place in the discussion uh, in, in a, an environment where um, content knowledge is actually devalued. Uh, what, what, when you say content knowledge... What, no, what, people who know what they're talking about, instead of people just hand-waving or using science to make some political point. You know, okay. somebody who actually understands um, what the satellite is measuring, somebody who understands how it does or does not connect to any other measurement that anybody has made, uh, what the models do or do not say, uh, by you know, from people who actually had looked at the models, as opposed to just had some image about what models are or were uh, that they were just using to make some some political point. So, and I, and I still think that those two uh, drivers are why I've kept going. Uh, the the number of people who know what they're talking about in the public discourse is quite small. Uh, the amount of information and context that is obviously missing from most of the rest of that discourse is blatantly obvious. Uh, and, you know, these are important things. People are interested. That, that, that was, that was the, the surprise, uh, was, to, was the extent to which people are interested. People are really interested by this topic, and they don't have uh, anywhere to go to get good answers. You know, you can go to Wikipedia, that's okay. You can go back to grad school, that's better. Uh, but, you know, most people don't even do uh, the, the first Google search. And so people have questions. They don't have time to find the answers by reading textbooks. 
Um, and so there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere for them to go. Between that point and now, you've, you've been through some pretty tumultuous experiences, everything from an attempted hack, well, actually... It was no, no, a successful hack. Successful hack, hack <laughs> for, for a moment, that, that also was, was related to the big uh, East Anglia event that became known as Climate Gate. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure there's lots of slings and arrows thrown at you, uh, as yes. there are anyone who's in this, in this arena. Right. Who puts their head above the parapet. Yeah, yeah, so, and then, of course, you know, as a NASA, as a federal employee, too, you, it must be, this is not an easy thing to do, but yet, yet you keep doing it. So, can, can you give these graduate students some idea of why it's been worth keeping at it through all of that? Because for every brickbat that gets thrown at you, I get 20 people that come up to me and thank me profusely for having explained something that they didn't understand or for pointing them in the direction of uh, information that they wouldn't have been able to find or showing them where the data was or by introducing them to papers that they wouldn't have seen um, or by you know creating a graphic that made something clear in their minds that wasn't clear uh, or just from being there and and uh, and doing something that they feel ought to be done, but but they haven't got time to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, there there is there is a there is there is far more um, positive uh, appreciation of, of what we do than there is uh, insults and uh, and negative comments. So you know, in in, in something like this. You, you can't avoid the negative comments. I mean, people, you can, you can say, oh, well, you know, all points of view are, are, are valid and, and everything is interesting, but I, I'm congenitally incapable of doing that. Um, science <coughs> and, and doing science is a very tough process of winnowing through the stuff that doesn't work and then building on the stuff that does. If you have to keep on saying that the stuff that has been shown not to work a hundred times is still interesting, then you never get anywhere because there's always far more things that are not interesting than there are that are actually interesting. And so science itself doesn't, doesn't behave like a democracy where every point of view is equivalent. Right? Science itself, there are, better, there, are, there are some things that are better than other things. There are, there are some descriptions of reality that are closer to reality than others. And you have to discard the ones that are not close to reality, otherwise you never get any. Right? So it's not so science is not a democracy of ideas where a thousand flowers are blooming all the time. You know, the flowers bloom and then the ones that don't bloom, you chop down and you plant a new crop. So you know, you might think you could go into this and and just, you know, give people what you know and then they'll appreciate it. But there comes a point where somebody insists that they know something that just isn't true. And some people will say, oh, well, that's very interesting. Let's agree to disagree. And, and other people will say, well, no, you're wrong because of this, this, and this. And, and in this particular field where, you know, opinions can be quite polarized um, and quite political, uh, there are people who cling to, to various untruths uh, quite doggedly. And, uh, and who don't appreciate being told that their untruth is, is in fact untrue. Um, so we, there's, there's always this, this tension um, that will uh, lead to you not keeping everybody happy 100% of the time. And so I've given up trying to keep everybody happy. Uh, so I just try and uh, be true to, uh, to myself and to the science. Um, and, uh, you know, that's... Uh, and, and that, that you know that's part of that that's part of the personality that comes out in these in in a blog. You know you don't you don't read a blog because it's it's robotic and it's just these are the facts. You know <laughs> read, read this paper. Uh, you know you, you, people like bloggers with personality. I mean you don't have to be rude to people. You don't have to be offensive. Um, and you can try and maintain a civil discourse. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should agree with everybody that every little random thing is interesting or that the 27th thousandth person who, uh, who accuses you of, uh, of being a fraud in the pay of George Soros and the Illuminati uh, should, be, uh, uh, should be indulged. Hey, Ewan, sir. Hi. I'm Jeff Devine. Um, I, so you've been blogging since 
2004-ish, 2005. I'm um, just wondering, like, have you seen more, like, sort of an increase in acceptance towards global warming since then? Kind of a slight increase um, overall, or has it really just yeah. been the same? So the, the nature of the questions that people ask us has changed. Uh, maybe not since 2004, but, but certainly since the beginning 2000s, you know, people would come up and ask us, so... Uh, so is this global warming thing? Is that is that real? Um, people don't ask us that anymore. So so now people ask us. So you know where, do, where does black carbon fit in this? You know what about stratospheric cooling? You know how you know how fast is the sea ice going to go away? You know people are asking us more subtle questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I and, and judging by that, I think there's there's been uh, some progress. Um, but. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily due to uh, to, to our blog or anything. Uh, in fact, I, I would be very surprised if that was the case. Um, but it's been sitting around as an issue for much longer. It's no longer a new issue to people. People have heard about it. Uh, people don't always know what to think about it, um, and they and they don't know who to trust about it. Um, but I, but there's there's very few people uh, who who've never heard of it. Whereas you know, ten years ago. There were still a lot of people who'd never heard of it as an issue. Sure. So, so there has been some progress. But then, you know, recently, and I would say just this is just in the last year, maybe year, year and a half, um, the, the the kind of uh, completely rejectionist um, kind of camp has become quite uh, has has emerged more powerfully. Um, and, and that's that's a little bit concerning, um, but but it may that it may just be you know the tides of political uh, uh, the tides of political fortune that it's pushing in that direction. Uh, they may recede again. All of the attributes of real climate could be uh, replicated in a blog about nuclear uh, energy, uh, about um, uh, toxic chemicals. In other words, yep. there are all these other arenas where there, there is extremely um, a wide range of views of the implications of the science, if not a wide range of expressions yeah. of what's I mean, true. And, and we, I mean, we weren't original with this model. I mean, we took it from uh, two blogs that existed at the time, uh, Cosmic Variance and The Panda Thumb, both of which are group blogs by scientists about science, uh, but were, were targeted on, on issues that people had uh, interest in. Panda Thumb is all about evolution, natural selection. Cosmic Variance is all about high energy physics. And in each case, they uh, they had you know dominant people who did most of the work. Uh, but they were all group blogs, uh, and they were all focused on you know part education, part self interest, part debunking of uh, of nonsense, um, and and. That is a that's a model I agree that can be uh, that can be rolled out in in other fields as well. One of the things that that I thought at the time when we started, I, I thought other people would do it uh, as well. I, I thought other groups would would pop up because it's clear that you know I, I don't have it's it's not like I have opinions that, that I've you know uh, that I've polled. You know I haven't I don't you know when I say something I haven't I haven't asked the rest of the scientific community whether they agree with me or not. Um, yet we are seen as the voice of the mainstream um, to the point where, you know, whenever somebody in the mainstream says something, even if I don't agree with it, we're, we're somehow to blame, which is, is, is curious. Um, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and that, that came as a surprise. I, I didn't anticipate that that would be the case. I thought that the people who, you know, at a conference uh, or, or a workshop, I have, robust arguments with, with many people about all sorts of different aspects uh, of the science. And there's lots of parts of the science where I think people are wasting their time. Um, you know, you think, well, why doesn't that community get together and have a blog and make their points and things? And, and that, that, that's, that remains a bit of a, a mystery. Retain a balance between doing your science and being a science communicator. This is something that's going to come up in their lives no matter where they end up? Um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, it, it's clear that these things take time. Um, the, 
but then, then other things take time too, right? So if I was teaching, that would take time. Um, <laughs> if I was uh, if I was training for the marathon, that would take time. Right. If I had kids, that would take time. Right. right? And so since I since I'm I'm done with marathons and I don't have kids and I don't have to teach, that gives me time to do, you know, to indulge in in this kind of stuff. Uh, but but you know what it's like, right? You know, you, you you have time management issues. You know, the more stuff that you have to do, the more efficient you partition your life. You know, most of the time that you spend, you're actually not doing anything of any interest. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we need to have time where we're just sitting around, you know, not doing anything. Uh, but most of the stuff that I do in terms of communication uh, is, is done uh, on, a, on a casual basis. You know, uh, if somebody sends me an email or asks me for a quote... I can do it immediately. I don't need to think about it too much. I don't need to prepare. I don't need to work at it for three hours, you know, uh, with with you know high concentration in order to get something like that. So the communication aspect um, is 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 something that's just you know it comes for free, given my background and interests, and so I don't need to work at it. Uh, now, if I wanted to be a really good communicator. Uh, say somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Neil, uh, you know, I've met him a couple of times, uh, and, and he's somebody who works really, really hard to be the best communicator that he can be. Uh, and uh, you know, and he measures his success in the, in the number, of, you know, the, the the percentage of his talks where he gets standing ovations. And, and he was like, he was worried for a while that it was only sixty percent. And uh, he managed, you know, with a little bit of effort to get it up to 80%. And uh, I'm going, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's impressive. Um, but he dedicates his life to just doing that. Now, you know, communication for me is a much more casual thing. So, I, I, so I'm never going to be a professional communicator in the way that Neil is. I say that a young scientist at this stage of life should, should dive into uh, Twitter or, and or a blog or or not people who are just coming into the field now are coming into a situation into a conversation that didn't exist when I came into the field right you, you, there, there is just a uh, a larger communication context to things that we're doing now than there was uh, 15 years ago or, or, or 20 years ago and people who are coming up from the beginning like they don't know that that's different, so they just see the situation as it is, uh, and they're gonna and they're gonna dive in because that's the that's the environment in which they they've grown up, and it's just it's just like why wouldn't you be doing this? Why would why wouldn't you be talking about your stuff? Um, and so I, th I think people are going to do this, and they're going to do it on a more casual basis. Um, and I and I think that's uh, I think that's great. Then what? Having a little bit of discipline in that, you know, I mean, just having like a science Facebook where people are just posting any old random thoughts, um, you know, maybe people in, you know, the, like now, you know, we can't concentrate for more than 15 minutes at a time, you know, maybe in 20 years time we'll be able to concentrate for more than a minute and that will, that will work. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, but the, 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 there's a, there's a need for, for training, uh, and in filling in the gaps between the extremely casual tweeting, say, uh, and the uh, and the, the, the IPCC assessment report, right? There's a there's a whole range of levels of communication that could that could fit in between those two things. And generally speaking, uh, you know, this this end of stuff is is coming up, and this end of stuff, you know, is never going to go away. But the stuff in the middle, that's where the people who know what they're talking about should be, should be acting. Because we're, we're not there collectively now. Some of us are, but, but we're not there collectively. And that kind of seeds that whole field uh, to, to the people who don't know anything and the people who are more fond of their own voice than they are of, of the facts and the people who want to uh, disinform and misinform them. Uh, the public, and so it's 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 that it's that area in the middle, the hinterland between the paper and 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 the and the tweet, 
um, where I think there's a lot more scope for, for, for us to communicate and where, quite frankly, the field is wide open. Actually, one, last, one reason the field is wide open is because of the implosion of traditional journalism to some extent, I would assume. Well, or not. So, so, so journalism and, 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 and science communication, they're not really the same things. You know, I mean, journalism is about news, right? right? It's a news industry. Most of what people don't know is not news. Right. It's just basic stuff, right? You can't, you know, I mean, you know how hard it is to write a newspaper article about the greenhouse effect. How is that news? We've right. known about that for 120 years, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, so, but people still have questions about the greenhouse effect, right? And so there's still, there's still a need for people to communicate about that. But it's not news. It's not journalism, right? It's, it's, if there's such a thing, is there such a thing as contextual journalism, right? You know, so that's, that's what we need. We need contextual journalists. And yeah, there's, we, no, there's no business model for that. Well, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. There's a website I've written about. NYU's Journalism School has a website called explainer.net. And the oh. explainers in journalism is the shorthand for the sidebar. The piece that says there was big news about Antarctica today. Here's how... Here's Antarctica is. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <probably, laughs> here's, here's, here's what an ice sheet is, you know, with this... A little bit more of the depth on the thing, or there was a big earthquake in Japan today. Here's what we know about what happened. So, so that there is a history of that, and unfortunately, that fortunately, I think that is a, just as you say, a place where the science community, particularly the institutions, school, the universities, and agencies, agencies have a real role to, to dive in. So, hey, this was great. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. and you're you're a champ for um, hanging out with us for a little while. Yeah, this is easy. So. <laughs> Good. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Take care.